So when I was uh, first starting out in, in law, I was an in-house counsel at an equipment finance company, and we did a lot of airplanes. And the lawyers and the staff taught me a lesson that first day. If our borrowers and our lessees don't pay, we lose some money. If we invest in the asset, we're relying on residual value, and the market falls, we lose some money. If the plane crashes and people die, we're out of business. And, and so with all of the terrific things that we've heard about the last couple of days, that's a game changer. So, okay, those are risks. And, and in particular, these kinds of assets, because the likelihood of an accident involving people is greatest with these kinds of assets. Um, so, let's go to the next slide. So how do you mitigate risks? Uh, th this slide is less than complete in, in terms of the mitigation. So, in particular, if you're the operator, you, you're going to go through lots of mitigation, especially you know complying with all the legal requirements, but having a safety management system in place. Um, my friends here are going to talk about what that really means. If you're a, a, a counterparty in a contract involving these assets, maybe you can allocate the risks, but uh, you know among the group of the counterparties right, because you, you can't allocate to a third party who's not a party to a contract. If you're a lender or, or a lessor or a passive owner, perhaps you could rely on this federal statute that's referenced here. It, it also has some gaps. Uh, the most important protection, though, is insurance. So we, we note here some of the principal coverages, but this is, a, this is an incomplete list. So for example, you also have, because these really apply to owners and operators, but you have manufacturer's insurance, you have um, air cargo insurance, air charter insurance, experimental aircraft insurance, airline insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of different insurance products that go to the various risks that are inherent in this business, and especially with uh, those of you who participate in the industry. Um, one of you mentioned just how insurance works. Like, what, what is it really there for? What is it, how does it, how does it apply and, or not apply? Right, so, because, right, it's a financial compensation when the, the, the management, the system management um, doesn't work? Safety management services yeah. don't work? Um, well, insurance is designed to make you whole if, it's, if you're the lender and protect you from third-party liability. But it's also a law, law of large numbers is the basis. So you don't just insure one airplane. Hopefully you insure hundreds of airplanes, thousands of airplanes, so you get some predictability. But um, the main principle is to make the stakeholder whole and protect the stakeholder from losing his business for third-party losses. Yeah, and, and I would just add, we also like to think that we help our clients um, not only respond to mishaps, but also recover so that they can carry forth with their business endeavors. But insurance is a business, right? So the premiums have to be greater than the claim amounts, right? So that's- I Ideally. Right? So, but Theoretically. That, Yes. Right, but, but right, isn't that, isn't that the business tension that you go through with, with developing and, and having products that, that could pertain to some of what we've heard about here? Um, okay. So um, these are two of the different owner-operator um, types of coverages. Um, talk about how the different types of, of hull uh, coverages that we have, different types of liability coverage we have, and something about war risk. Um. The hull insurance is as basic as your comp and collision on an auto. So you're, if you damage the airplane landing, if a third party damages it, or um, the engine has an FOD, foreign object damage, and included in the hull is war risk insurance. So if you're in Nigeria and uh, somebody attacks your airplane, that's covered if you have war that applies there. So. It's very important. Liability insurance also has a component of, of war, because if, if you're involved in a war-related incident, it's not going to cover unless you have war. If your airplane's stolen or confiscated, that's also a war risk. So for a lender, uh, if a G4, which happens once in a while, is stolen from Mexico and never recovered, that's covered under war risk. Or the Brazilian seizure aircraft because you didn't pay taxes. Correct. Right. Yeah, it's a little uh, more complicated. I'd let Nick address that. The, the last aspect of that would be terrorism, though. Correct. And terrorism is covered under war. In the U.S., we have a thing called TRIA, Terrorism Reinsurance Act, which only covers, Nick, you can correct 
scrutiny if it's an actual certified act of terrorism, that the U.S. government says, yes, Red Dawn is a certified terrorist group, they attack your airplane, you get paid. Otherwise, war is pretty far out coverage. Yeah, and so the, that Terrorism Risk Insurance Act has been in place since, since the events of September 11th. Uh, fortunately, it's not been triggered uh, since it's been enacted. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, disruptive events, like I remember the day after. I remember going through all the leveraged lease documents I had for all the commercial aviation assets and looking at the insurance policies and going through them and trying to figure out whether there was coverage or there wasn't. Um, a lot of lessons were learned that day. Okay, so how do insurers look at new technology? Um, when, you, when you consider all of what we've heard today, um, how do you determine insurability? So, so I work for Global Aerospace, so I'm, I'm on the insurance, um, insurance underwriting side. I actually help, help our company set underwriting strategy. So I'm, I'm coming at it from that perspective. I also spend a lot of time structuring product liability programs for OEMs, uh, and that's on the full spectrum. So some of the big traditional airframers and engine makers, all the way to some of the Silicon Valley startups who are building what I'll call flying cars. So when we think of new technology at, at my company, uh, you can think of drones and flying cars, space tourism. I'd put personal flying devices in there. Uh, rocket launches, and certainly with the, with the new technology where you can reuse portions of the rocket. All of those are really neat technologies, um, and it's certainly an opportunity for us as an insurance provider to sell more of our product. So, so it's an exciting time for, for us as insurance providers, but there's also some concerns as well. And when we look at some of these new companies and we look at things like personnel, uh, balance sheets, uh, manufacturing acumen, if they've even manufactured things before, um, certainly the management team, the personnel, uh, any kind of history that they might have. Th those are certainly some of the things that we take into consideration in the underwriting process. Um, and we've had some struggles as, as we sort of contemplated some of the new technologies. So I'm looking at the slide, uh, developments around engine technology uh, or even some of the battery technologies. So we've had some significant claims in our space related to uh, some teething issues with, with some of the new engine technology, certainly the battery stuff with the 787s a few years ago. Um, that airplane was grounded. There was a, a couple of battery fires. And so the, those were significant claims. The, the stuff that's happening with the engine technology and where there's been some groundings of, of airliners, uh, those are really significant claims that are beginning to work their way through the system. And <clears throat> we're working our way around it, um, kind of in it together with all of the stakeholders in, in aerospace, um, but there's some concerns. I, I look at it slightly different because I'm a broker, and my philosophy is all things are insurable if you want to pay the price, which is actually true, and I think you would agree with that. That So the difficult thing, I think, in watching all the other presentations, listening to the new technology things. I think the problem that the underwriter and the broker are up against is there's really no track record with those things. So if you, if you look at Nick's comment about like the Trent engine thing, the battery runaway thing that they paid ground, what they call grounding losses to people for, that was kind of a known element. They understood that manufacturing process. So I think the, even though this is all exciting stuff, it's very difficult and you know, we do a lot of one-off high tech things, and those are really difficult because a lot of them don't come to fruition. The investors don't really understand the obstacle to getting insurance. So the business plan is like, okay, X, Y, Z, and then they call you and say, well, what do you think insurance would be for the first the passenger space flight? I'm like, real expensive. <laughs> but you can get it. You should never let an insurance company tell you you can't get it, but you're not going to get what you want, and you may not get the quality of protection you want. How could anybody with any particular circumstance project what the cost might be, what the premium cost might be? Is, is there some formula that they could use? Is there some you know, set of analytics that, that they could rely on? Or is it more calling up their friendly broker, saying, what do I do? How do I do it? You know, what do you need to know? 
Well, that, that's certainly one of the challenges for us as an insurance provider is pricing, pricing these coverages. So I was referring to grounding coverage, which, uh, which is insurance jargon, really. I should, say, I should say business interruption. So when the airplanes are on the ground and can't be flown, uh, the airlines suffer significant costs related to those airplanes coming out of service until, until the problem can be remediated. But the issue that we're grappling with is that we have a limited data set. So what is the right price to charge a client to provide business interruption coverage if the technology that they provide to, to an OEM or, or that they develop themselves as an OEM falls short of expectations and causes disruptions? It's a difficult thing. Unlike auto insurance, which uh, has lots and lots of units, and you can develop some pretty good data, uh, aviation is a whole lot more finite, and it's definitely one of the struggles that we have as an insurance provider. And the other issue is that aviation insurance used to go in defined cycles. Those are the good old days where prices get high, then they get lower. Now it's just been kind of a steady thing, but there is a lot of capacity insurers that will write this type of stuff, but you know, you have to rely on using multiple insurers, so you would go to somebody like Global and say, well, what do you think the price should be? And everybody else follows along, so you build a little pile of insurers. But it is, uh, it, it is very challenging for both the broker and the underwriter, because the broker, he has no pricing authority, so he has to go based on his experience. Something brand new, you don't have any experience. And, and as Nick was saying before, you know, you're relying on their mitigation. Oh, yeah. Right, you're relying on them to do those things that make sense to avoid the injury, because it, that's, that's really how insurance works. But the businesses are so new, and they're in such a rush to get there, that you know, it, there's a tension there as well. Yeah, and I, I would also add, is certainly with some of the new technologies and eVTOL and things like that, we're kind of in a honeymoon phase right now, where we sort of look around and we get inspired by by some of the technology and the ideas that folks have, really haven't mass produced them. They're not really in the stream of commerce just yet. Um, that's really where the rubber is going to meet the road. Um, what's it going to be like then? And, and that's where we'll, we'll certainly be monitoring things and watching very carefully, but I think that's going to be the real test. Will these vehicles operate as advertised? Well, so, because many of these are in the experimental stage, they're almost all in the experimental stage, how does that work? How, how does the interaction between the insurance community and the developer you know, work so that they keep you informed, you keep them informed? Yeah, so we, we try to assist to the extent that we can in terms of, say, contractual language development, um, protocols as it relates to hold harmless agreements, and, and they keep us informed in terms of how their, how their test flying is going or their prototype development and some of the lessons that they've learned. And we've seen some of the, some of the clients uh, begin to shift gears and, and change the way that they're going to make the product. The use case for the product changes. It's very dynamic. It's very fluid. It's changing all the time. So we would like to stay in close contact with them as they begin to, to bring products into the market. Uh, the, the last bullet point there, somewhat confusing just to look at it, but really the thought there is, is that we have all this new technology and the risk could be human error associated um, or it can be, it could relate to an automation issue, in other words, programming, software. Um, you want to speak to how that might work, Ed or, or Nick? Well, I mean, my perspective on that is based on probably, you know, there have been some accidents, both I know on the auto side and the aviation side, where the finger's been pointed at the programming of their technology where, or the technology is too complicated to, and the programming doesn't support it. But I think that's a real challenge and that's a real unknown. So when you go to talking about um, autonomous airplanes, I mean, I've seen some crazy things with drones hitting newspaper reporters and, but I mean, not, but, nothing made. Well, that was at a Republican rally. Yes, it yeah, was. It was at a Republican rally. Yeah. That's where it happened. But not the Fox reporters. No, no, okay. the Fox person was safe, but everyone else got Sorry, hit. I'm from DC, I had to. Yeah. But, I think that's a huge challenge, especially for underwriters, because we really don't understand the, the ins and outs of coding or writing code, and you sit down and speak to someone who writes that code, you know less than when you sat down with them the first time, right? <laughs> I had a guy explain this to me, and he said, well, you know, I think I'm going, I am- Zero one, zero yep, one. Yep. Yeah. 
He said, I like, I like coding, but I think I am for sales. I said, uh, no, you're not for sales because I can't under, but it's the technology, the person who does that has to think that way. So it's hard for us to grasp, and I think it's hard for the underwriter. Yeah, I would just, I would just add that, um, and I'm looking at the question that's come in, in terms of whether we like autonomous or, or human-flown machines, and we would err on the side of, of autonomy. Um, so pilots, they, they take a beating, right? When there's a, when there's a mishap, uh, a lot of finger pointing is at the pilots, and they're humans like all of us, and, and mistakes are made, and unfortunately, aviation is very unforgiving, and so when a mistake is made, the consequences can be really high. We like the automation. Um, we think that's, that's sort of the next step in the industry um, in terms of safety. The one thing that worries us is, uh, I guess, a degradation in troubleshooting skills when the automation doesn't work the way it's supposed to. And we have a couple of real-world uh, claim scenarios where that's happened. Think of, think of things like Air France back in 2009, uh, or even Colgan Air, uh, the United Express flight going to Buffalo uh, back in 2009. You know, those are examples where, you know, the pilots had, the, had all the automation set up and, and flying the airplane, um, and then the chips kind of, chips fell and uh, chips were down and they, they were just not able to react to it. So that's a little bit worrisome, despite the fact that generally we like the automation. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have some of the traditional coverages that we now have to apply to non-traditional assets. Um, do you see there being, that the template will still be the typical coverage types and then just have them be modified, adjusted to evolve towards whatever the asset is? I, I think so. I mean, the, the big third party risk, that's not gonna change. Um, the thing that, that's kind of evolved is as Nick said, you know, you have the business interruption loss for the downtime for the engines. Now you have it with the cyber. So you, cyber is a catch-all for basically computer stuff. But the cyber risk is very real. And, you know, look at the, the Target case, which is a very famous case. And uh, they hacked into, the, it was the air conditioning contractor that hacked into Target. So I, we've noticed our parent company gets a lot of requests for insurance certificates. Some of the airlines have started asking for cyber liability from vendors. So they're aware of it too. So that's, that's a new twist. And does cyber cause bodily injury? Yes, it can. And it's in the Air France case and other cases. It can also just ca cause a huge amount of aggravation. So yeah, it's a new challenge. Yeah, when I, think of, when I think of the new technology and some of, the, some of the Silicon Valley startups that we're providing insurance to and juxtapose it to traditional bodily injury and property damage, we're trying to provide the same level of coverage to, to the new startups. We want it to be, uh, we, we don't want to dilute it because if we dilute the coverage, then we get put into a position of having to deny claims percent, potentially, and that's a bad outcome for everybody. So we're trying to structure it the way we've structured uh, more traditional uh, insurance offerings. What might be a little bit different is some of the limits of liability that we make available. We may try to hedge our bets, so to speak, by not offering uh, high limits of liability until we can see these folks get something of a track record under their belt. Um, we might price it a little bit higher than, than some of the people might like, but those are some of the, some of the mechanism to tools that we'd use to address that. Regarding um, cyber, you know, some of my OEM client friends tell me that it's impossible to hack into the flight deck of an airplane. The architecture is just different, uh, you know, from me being in the back of my laptop. I hope that's true. It's certainly worrisome. And as we see greater connectivity all around aircraft, um, it's something that we're thinking about in another area of, of concern, I would say. But you're confident the Russians won't do that? Well, right, right. That's, that's okay. Another yes. political thing, but but among the interesting things we've been hearing about, um, I, I kept thinking about products liability, um, products liability, service providers liability, like software designers. Um, have you been addressing questions from the industry about those, and uh, where do you see things headed? Well, ultimately, so one of I think I mentioned earlier, one of my specialties is uh, product liability, and. <clears throat> The main thing that we uh, are, are, 
I guess the, the one thing that we're looking at is when we insure these startups or we insure the traditional OEMs, we are insuring accidents. We're insuring bodily injury and property damage. So people have to get hurt. Something has to break for coverage to trigger. Uh, the question is, what are, we, what are we gonna do in addition to that going forward? Is there a way for the aviation market to provide some sort of cyber coverage? We haven't done it heretofore. Uh, privacy, so we think about drones, right? Drones brings aviation much closer to the ground, and you've got privacy issues associated with that. We really haven't seen the volume of claims as it relates to privacy that we anticipated when we got into the drone insurance business about seven or eight years ago. It's another thing that we're looking at. Can we offer some privacy coverage uh, to better insulate our clients from those kinds of claims? And then other liability, I'm looking at that last bullet point, just thinking about, again, other types of business interruption coverage that we can buy, provide, maybe something more robust than we traditionally provided. Supply chain risks, you know, is there, is there something there that we could provide to clients? It's an ongoing conversation. The other problem with that too is that there's no proven policy form. So you will get involved as a lawyer trying to interpret the form where many of our forms are, are very established by precedent. So the cyber risk, when you present that to customers, they're like, this doesn't cover what I need. How many people have read insurance policies before to try to determine whether the coverage was sufficient? Wow. Um, were Thanks. you surprised, happily surprised, that everything that you thought would be covered was covered? Raise your hand if you were happily surprised that everything, right, exactly, there's no hands raised. And, and that's, that's the problem with it. They're, they're intimidating to read because they're in their own jargon. And most of us rely on insurance certificates which aren't the policy. They don't, so, they don't give you anything. The right. insurance certificate gives you nothing. So, and, and that's, that's the trap, that's the, it's the jargon trap. But, but when, if you do read all of them, and I have, it's not there. And, and so then you go, you get into the value prop. Yeah, you have it as a checklist item and you can check that, you know, particular checklist item, but whether it suffices for its intended purposes. So, so if, if you do, by the way, so if you put it, send out one of these creative policies and you get a response back that, you know, it doesn't cover what I'm particularly concerned about, how do you address that? Well, we, we want to be very, very proactive and upfront about that because the last thing we want to do is sell an insurance policy that does not respond the way that the client thought it would respond. I mean, let's face it, insurance, um, it can be nebulous. It's, it's unnecessarily esoteric at times. We are trying to streamline and simplify the insurance process. You know, I'm sure all of you or many of you have filled out insurance applications, particularly like commercial insurance applications, and they're seven or eight pages long, and they ask for your life story, and they're just tedious, right? I mean, we've got to figure out a way to simplify it. And that's one of the other things that we're doing in terms of some of the newer risks, and certainly with drones, we're changing the way we distribute. And so we can provide you with an app, and we can sell insurance by the hour, uh, and cut down the number of questions that we ask, just trying to simplify it. So. There still has to be some unforeseen aspect to it, right? In other words, there's some certainties that irrespective of the type of insurance or type of risk that, that will exist with, with every analysis as to whether you're gonna insure. Sure. Well, I mean, especially with cyber, somebody asked a question. With cyber, it's not if, but when for hacking or breach. Totally correct. One of the underwriters who writes a lot of cyber that I talked to told me, he said, the way I price it is I figure if there's a breach, it's $300 per person that had their data breached, hmm. which is mind boggling. But the form has so many exclusions in it, you could have a breach and it might not be covered. So it's, it's very difficult. Thanks. Okay, so aviation market ready to underwrite new risks. So market demand. You know, what's the market demand, the current availability of coverage, and we'll talk about the role of regulations. Um, pick any of them you want to start with. I would say that I think, I think the aviation insurance market has done a pretty good job in terms of being ready to react to, to the emerging technologies, and I, and I do think we at Global Aerospace are certainly ready to confront this. Um, I think so, several of my peers would tell you the same thing. I think there's a healthy amount of coverage available. You may not like the price necessarily, but, but I think there's a, a good amount of coverage. Uh, I think we're responding to that. So you, you think that the, that the insurers are at least 
if not, they're riding the curve, if not ahead of the curve, as opposed to behind the curve. Yes. Okay. I think there is, I agree with Nick, there's, there's a lot of capacity and the big thing is the pricing because you may not want to, you may not want to buy it at the price that's available. So what risk circumstances would fit within the coverages that you're aware of now? And what did you hear about over the last two days that, that you're thinking, hmm, there's not a coverage for that or anything that's close enough so that we could, you know, cause it to evolve to, to cover that risk? Or, or, so most things within the, you know, what you think are the appropriate risk coverages, are there any that you've, any ideas you've heard out here that would give you the impression that there's not a product that's readily available for it or that perhaps we could even stretch to because there's just not enough data, right? We're not, we're not there yet. Any concerns about that? Well, the one thing that comes to mind for me is, is eVTOLs. So th those, those machines will be operating, uh, many of them, in urban environments. So traditionally, when we think about business jets or airlines, when they crash, they tend not to crash in crowded cities with obviously some notable exceptions. The, you know, the urban air mobility and eVTOL, that's all going to be exposures that are in highly populated areas. So there's a bigger risk now for bodily injury and property damage on the ground. A lot of times we're concerned about people getting hurt on the airplane and bodily injury and fatalities to passengers. The eVTOL movement will change that in the sense that we're now worried about stuff on the ground more so than we have been worried about in the past. But the policy form's already there, right, Nick? You've already got it, so you don't have to reinvent the policy form, and that wording is kind of defined. It's a matter of whether you want to take the risk on writing something new like that. I mean, if we get to the point where, you know, in some of these videos that we've seen where you have these multiple platforms throughout a city, you know, with all these aviation assets on them, I keep thinking about aircraft, airport insurance, right? Um, handlers insurance, but insurance relating to things like security, right? You know, how do you, how do you possibly secure all those facilities in in a way where you're, you're confident that you know the passengers and that the general public are going to be safe? It's just the volume of of you know aviation in a particular populated space. That's what lawyers think about, right? Like we curb your enthusiasm, so to speak. Um, Okay, in terms of coverage amounts, that'll just evolve, right? In terms of what you're willing, yes. the limits at which you're, you're willing to go, and it'll depend on premiums and, and the like. Do um, you see regulations uh, covering minimum amounts or, or types of coverage? So the Department of Transportation puts forth some minimum insurance requirements for, for airlines or 135 operators, and, and they're generally very, very minuscule. Uh, most most uh, operators buy much higher limits. One of the things, when I think about regulations, one of the things I think about is certification. So will all these eVTOLs be certified? Uh, will all these flying cars be certified? Will the pilots that operate them, whether they're in the vehicle or operating it from the ground, will they be certified going forward? So certification has been helpful from an underwriting perspective because it's it's a step in the process to help vet risk. And in the future, will that be less than what it's been traditionally, uh, something that we will have to watch going, going forward? And that'll be a liability for the insurer too because many of the coverage forms will say standard airworthiness certificate. Um, so those will be loopholes that could, not intentionally, but you could have a claim denied that way. I mean, the training issue is of concern to me, right? It's just so many different assets out there and, and people operating them, whether it's manually or through, you know, some form of automation, that, you know, it, it worries me that they're going to be, um, they're going to be operated in a safe way and, and that the, there's enough regulatory, practical regulatory um, uh, imposition you know, to make sure that there's a safe, that they're a safe operation. Well, it's not the standardized training environment of the 135s where they're going to full motion simulator, or they're certified by the FAA as a commercial pilot or whatever, so I think that's a real challenge. It's gonna be difficult. Okay. Yeah, and, and then you think about what happened, um, I guess a few days ago, maybe before the weekend in Greenville, South Carolina, a Falcon 50 crash with two fatalities and two critical, critically wounded people 
uh, not to pick on this event, just I was just thinking there's some media reports today that suggested that the pilots were not qualified to fly that airplane. So in this day and age where that's a certified airplane, those pilots had, would have had to meet certain criteria, to think that maybe that didn't happen, uh, and now you kind of go to the opposite end of the spectrum and think about flying cars, like, how are we gonna police all that? You know, so, something to be thinking about. Okay. So, questions. I've been ignoring all the electronic questions because I've ADD, and I started looking then, I, it would have been a bad scene. Um, John. Is there a s central data source for that one can look at or at the risks or you know, the kinds of things that underwriters look at? So if you're trying to, uh, you know, maybe p uh, trying to develop a new insurance product to cover some of these risks, where can, where can you go to look at data? Or does each underwriter have their own secret data sources? Uh, th yeah, thanks for the question. It's a good one. Um, it's a combination of all of the above. So there are some sort of centralized repositories of certain data, but then also the insurance companies keep their own data. So we, it's kind of a hybrid for us. We use some of the public data, we use our own data, um, but it's always something that we're clamoring for. More data, more data, more data. Uh, and it's difficult because some of our peers don't necessarily want to share their data. So we don't have all of it. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the for the panel. Uh, curious about uh, do you do either of you insure Part 135 helicopter operators today? And you is is the insurance on those different if if they're operating in an urban environment versus a more rural environment? Uh, fixed wing helicopter. How do those rates compare? That sort of thing. Thank you. Um, I I don't do many helicopters, so I'll defer to Nick on that. So we, we do have a fairly sizable uh, helicopter portfolio, and that's a challenging area for us. I think it's been a challenging area for the industry, particularly if you think back over the last 10 years with some of the EMS activity, we've seen too many of those helicopters crash, uh, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. In terms of helicopters, we're, we just there's probably a higher level of scrutiny in the underwriting process the rates generally are higher, uh, deductibles are higher in helicopters, but there are some terrific operators that have a very good track record and we have relationships with them, so you have to pick your spots in that, in that sector. Uh, do you think uh, captive insurance might have a role to play in pooling some of the risk for these new technologies? Um, I, I think it'll be difficult. I, we used to, I operated a captive at one time and the, the, the catch-22 with a captive is they're really useful if no one will insure it at all, but if you have the commercial market will insure some of the things, you, it's probably not gonna endure, and you're kind of going into the business of insurance when your business is manufacturing airplanes or other things. Going further than the captive, uh, if someone's operating a large fleet of autonomous EV tolls, mm -hmm. they're going to know more about the risk. They built it. They're going to know much more about its risks than any underwriter will know or actuary will Absolutely. know. Absolutely, yeah. And they're going to be large enough that they don't need to pool risk with anybody. So why would they go to insurance companies? Why wouldn't they self-insure? Because they still need to buy um, stop stopgap. They need to buy excess insurance. If, you know, basically, if you have a a captive for just the purpose of fronting the covers, like UPS used to have one to insure their parcels. And it became so profitable, the insurance industry shut them down. But um, you, you always have to buy reinsurance for the captive, otherwise you're, you're truly self-insured, which you're probably not gonna be able to qualify as a true self-insurer for all the ancillary coverages. But it's very difficult to just have a captive with no reinsurance. Well, if you're Larry Page, you don't have capital problems. So. True. And on that I, I, note, wouldn't, I wouldn't rule that out. I mean, I, I wouldn't rule out it may be necessary. the possibility yeah. of, of that happening in the future. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, just thinking about some of the traditional OEMs and the limits of liability that they purchase, 
So one and a half billion, two billion, two and a half billion per event, um, that's tough to put together in a captive, that kind of capacity. So uh, hopefully for us, uh, there won't be this great migration to captives. So uh, they'll, they'll still need a, the financial backing of, a, of an insurance company. But it could be a sort of a hybrid where they take on more risk and we just, and maybe we're in the mix for those really catastrophic exposures and those really bad days that might happen.